This is Ambazonia Calling. News, analysis, commentary, opinion, editorials. Ambazonia Calling is a co-production of Africa Freedom Network, The Missions Tribune, and Compass Free Press. Welcome. My name is Ntumfoin Bo Herbert, and I bring revolutionary greetings from our studios in Washington, D.C., to all of you, friends of Ambazonia and fellow Ambazonians on Ground Zero and across the globe. Leaders of one of the leading agencies for the independence of Southern Cameroons, the Gulf Sea, and its defense arm, the Ambazonia Defense Forces, are making bold to support any uprising that will topple the year in favor of a government that is friendly to Ambazonia. I am innocent here. Who is a contender and who is an enabler? The simple answer is, it depends. This is Lambert Mom. When faced with the binary of justice or peace, I urge Ambazonians to seek justice, not peace. This is Manjong Judambe. A runny nose here, stomach upsets there, feelings of nausea and vomiting. The emerging Ambazonia nation is going through its share of childhood challenges. This is Delano Mukong. One of the untold stories and unsung songs of military heroism is that of women in the ranks of the Ambazonia guerrilla forces. I am C. Ajinvo Ambe. Hello, my name is Veronique Vatimfen. I am hosting The Devil Unmasked from Kigali, capital of Rwanda. The world will call anyone seeking freedom all kinds of names. This has been the monk from Hibalikumato. I do not know if Karna Tumi has been given one of those golden statues by beer. But if he has, then Ambazonians must start praying for his deliverance. This is kosher. A very happy Sunday to you all and welcome again to Ambazonia Calling. Thanks for joining us and for spending a part of your Sunday with us. Next Friday and Saturday, Southern Cameroonians will gather in the Washington DC metro area to take stock, evaluate progress, and chat what hopefully will be a more collaborative way forward in the quest for the restoration of the independence of Amazonia. As usual, not everyone is agreed on whether a conference should hold or not. And the big question editorialist Lambert Mbom is posing this week is, who exactly is afraid of the forthcoming All Southern Cameroon's People's Conference? Even more than who is afraid, the question which dominated online discussions this week was who is a contender and who is an enabler? The simple answer is, it depends. Ambazonians have become great copycats. They are into this game of labeling, giving a, a dog a bad name. If you have tried but failed to pull your rivals down, then just throw a label on the kitchen sink at them to see if something will stick. Call them enablers. How about that? Our people have been revolting enough at the colonizers playing this labeling game at our expense when they have called us Biafrans, Nigerians, Anglo fools, dogs, roaches, rats, secessionists, and even terrorists. This week, some among us served slices of the same poisoned cake. Enter the enablers and the contenders. Groups and individuals tired of waiting to be the ones in charge tried a new shortcut to power by painting everyone else but themselves enablers. A barrage of audios, write-ups and videos popped up in more places on social media than you can count, castigating fellow Ambazonians for the simple reason that they are holding a conference. The purported contenders do not approve of the forthcoming All Southern Cameroon's People's Conference, not any more than DOs and SDOs of the BR regime would ever approve a conference unless its goal is to sing Osana to BR in the highest. 
The argument is not that enablers and collaborators do not exist. It is that the fellows calling themselves contenders and labeling others enablers are not so secretly seeking to meet with the same enablers in order to advance what they call contendership. Talk of hypocrisy. Amazonians, for goodness sake, must be free to assemble, to enable or to contend. What the heck is wrong with those who see enablers everywhere? Ahead of the Reboot Workshop last February 28, 2018, ahead of the Boston Conference last December 2018, and ahead of the APNC, which held in Philadelphia last month, these conspiracy theorists swimming in the political mud worked over time to derail these meetings of bona fide Amazonian activists. Who has forgotten the tall tales of commando mission of generals coming from Cameroon, loaded with cash they could not take out of ATM machines, headed for Philadelphia to stage another Nera hotel-style abduction at the APNC. Today, the contenders want you to believe that anyone who is not with them is an enabler. Give me a break. It must take a lavish dose of naivete to be more myopic than our forebears who could meet at the Mamfe All-Party Conference in the summer of 1959 as one big, diverse, and tolerant Ambazonian family. If you ask me, we will truly become contenders by facing up to, not running away from our enemies, foreign and domestic. Those we need to win over are those who are not with us, not those who are with us. As Christ said, it is those who are sick who need a doctor. Our forebears came up against the same international community we are up against today, and the international community played them 419. That same international community is struggling to scam us again today, and we must design a strategy to prevent the same outcome from prospering. The only enabler who truly has power and that we must consider is the international community. Never forget that in 1959, as today, the majority of our people voted in favor of independence at the Mamfe Conference. But it is the majority that lost, with their option completely excluded from the plebiscite. Never forget that the majority of UN member states voted in favor of our independence. But the enablers at the United Nations ensured that Cameroon, which voted against and lost, ended up the winner. The enablers are everywhere in the international community, and we need to work together more, not label each other more, in order to confront and defeat them. Now, that is what I call contendership. This is Lambert Mbom from Bazonia Corp. Cameroon has done to us, I want you never to forget the pain they have brought to bear on this generation. I want you never to forget, not out of hate, but so that the next generation will remember and make sure they do the things they are supposed to do, never to go through this again. I will continue to play my part to ask the people of Southern Cameroon to take their revolution into their hands and continue the fight to liberate themselves. I'm sorry to say, because of France's policies in Africa, in French Africa, the state of La Republic du Cameroon do not have any pressure on them to find a way to resolve this issue. Because they are always thinking that no matter what happens, France will always be there to give them coverage. Still ahead in this edition, we have the Devil on Mask with Professor Emmanuel Tatamenta. We have a winner of the Nyamfuka of the Week. And we are not done until you have heard our letter to Joshua. So stay tuned, kick back, relax, and enjoy Ambazonia calling.
It has been another week when families across Ambazonia have continued to mourn the massacres unfolding before their very eyes. Here is Innocent Chair with the first part of our news wrap-up for this week. The United Nations protocols empower all peoples and parties to act with the, quote, responsibility to prevent genocide and the, quote, responsibility to protect. An official statement of the government of Great Britain released Thursday and calling for an inclusive political dialogue to address the root causes of the crisis between La Repubblica du Cameroon and Ambazonia has been dismissed by notable pro-independence Ambazonians as too little and misleading. Leading British historical and legal agencies and none other than French President Emmanuel Macron have equally and recently asserted colonialism was and is a crime against humanity. In a missive Friday, the editor-in-chief and anchor of Ambazonia Calling, Bo Herbert, chronicled how Britain and France denied Southern Cameroons the option of standalone independence in 1961. And after the New Age energy deal last year, are at it again with calls for a ceasefire without any commitment by the UN Security Council to deploy peacekeeping forces, thereby granting La Repubblica du Cameroon latitude to continue wanton violence and acts of genocide against Ambazonia. The only practical solution from distance is a political settlement with either a United Nations or African Union peacekeeping contingent being placed on the ground to enable an immediate cessation of violence, ensuring a humanitarian protective intervention, and a cooling off period to create the conditions to allow an equitable settlement to be hammered out. We are not going to build a Southern Cameroons mm. on manipulations. We shall build Southern Cameroons on truth. Ahead of the All Southern Cameroons People's National Conference, which will be holding next weekend, March 29th and 30th in Washington, D.C., conference architects are reportedly finalizing a sustainable platform for the restoration movement. We will not win this revolution by being stupid. We will win this revolution by being strategic. We will win this revolution by even embracing what Martin Luther King Jr. said is at some point a necessary maladjustment. Because Martin Luther King Jr. makes clear that in life there is a necessary maladjustment at some times. The moments where you accept to be foolish in order to get wiser. As the conference registration page continues to get more hits by Ambazonians, even out of the United States, conference organizers spend the week making clear distinctions between the People's Conference in D.C. and the Cardinal Tumi Initiative that is backed by the colonial government and supported by the international community to maintain the status quo. What do you contend to say when somebody comes out there and says he cannot hold a meeting with enablers, but at the same time he has issued invitations to those same people he calls enablers to sit down in a meeting with him and discuss? How do you call that? Our sources also made it a point to emphasize that contrary to what Rumorville has it, Dr. Nebel Fontaine is more than a gentleman of the revolution. You threatened that because Dr. Fontaine refused to talk on your platform, because he refused to honor your platform, that he, he refused to talk to you, and so you are going to deal with him. From a meeting in Dublin, Ireland, leaders of one of the leading agencies for the independence of Southern Cameroons, the Ambazonia Governing Council, IGOVC, and its defense arm, the Ambazonia Defense Forces, are making bold to support any uprising that will topple the Bia regime in La Repubblica du Cameroon in favor of a government that is friendly to Ambazonia. The right of the Ambazonian people and for myself to authorize the Ambazonian Defense Forces and to support any indigenous resistance within Cameroon that overthrows the existing system that practices genocide within Ambazonia is now a policy of the governing council of Ambazonia. The resolution is part of what organizers have called the Dublin Declaration, also highlighting the sacrifices of Ambazonian forebears and Ambazonians on ground zero who are staring down the barrel of the gun and still opting for independence. We declare Ambazonia as an endangered people.
With the low currency and decline of the interim government group, many are seeing the current moves of the AGOV Council Group as a soft coup d'etat to replace an illegitimacy with another, both refusing to obtain the mandate of Ambazonians via the ballot box in keeping with known UN statutes. The governing council of Ambazonia will not sit, talk, facilitate, negotiate with any enabler of our revolution. Let's leave the character assassination thing out. You can criticize my viewpoint without calling me names, especially when you have to fight so hard to call me a name which may not necessarily stick. How does that even help? The U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, Tibor Nagy, has wrapped up his highly anticipated visit to Cameroon amid mixed reviews from La Bridge Cameroon and Ambazonians. Whereas the official press in Yaoundé celebrated an emphasis by the diplomat that their talks with President Biya focused on common interests, proponents for a free Ambazonia celebrated the symbolic picture that the diplomat gifted President Paul Bia. It was a picture of Bia during an official visit in the Reagan years, perhaps a reminder that Bia has outlived his welcome in power. Ambazonians also noted the fact that the visit was limited to La République du Cameroon and not anywhere close to Ambazonia. You are listening to Ambazonia Calling, your space for educated news analysis, informed opinions and commentary towards the recognition of a free, independent Ambazonia. I am Innocent Chair. Stay with us. Innocent Chair isn't going anywhere. He's got the second part of our news wrap-up for the week. Residents in and around Batu, a suburb of Bamenda, reported several hours of heavy gunfire Saturday evening between colonial forces of Cameroon and Ambazonia Restoration Forces. At the time of this report, no reliable source could confirm casualties on either side. On Friday, meantime, seven young men were gunned down by the genocidal military of Cameroon in the popular Travelers neighborhood in Bamenda, northern zone of Ambazonia. The shooting killing was reportedly in retaliation of the burning to death last Friday of a police officer by suspected amber fighters. On Thursday, the trigger-happy forces of La République du Cameroon gunned down an innocent taxi driver in Bamenda and arrested Saturday scores of packed motorbike riders. According to sources, the motorbike riders could have been arrested for any number of reasons related to an encyclopedia of new rules laid down by the colonial administration, including painting their bikes yellow and putting on identification jackets. Meantime, last Wednesday in Bangor, two soldiers were fatally shot by Ambazonian fighters and several others reportedly suffered severe but non-life-threatening injuries. Also midweek, unidentified gunmen kidnapped and later released 20 University of Boya soccer players who were practicing for one of the competitions that Ground Zero fighters have banned. According to pictures shared on WhatsApp forums, all 20 players underwent serious physical torture, thankfully with no life-threatening injuries. Finally, in foreign news, Civil servants at the Ministry of Defense of La République du Cameroon have been put on notice to expect salary delays in the coming weeks and months. While blaming the problem to a glitch on their computer system, observers are saying this is likely symptomatic of a deeper financial crisis accelerated by the Ambazonian Revolution on the klepto economy. Business in Cameroon, an online publication reported on Friday that all six aircrafts of, Com of Cameco, the national aviation company, were out of order, not airworthy, and not accepted in airports across the world. A source with inside knowledge hinted to Ambazonia calling that all options are on the table with regards to the future of Cameco. Innocentia. Ambazonia calling. This is Ambazonia. One nation, one soul.
one people, sacrificing, bleeding, and yes, dying if need be, until we kick the colonialists out and enthrone a government of the people in Boya. It is not every week that we are blessed to have the opportunity of interviewing someone from another country, someone who exactly understands the predicament in which Ambazonia finds itself, someone whose country has gone through a genocide and who can relate, and who can tell the people of Ambazonia exactly what's going on. On the other side of this musical interlude, we're going to have Veronique Vetimfe from out of Kigali, Rwanda, with the devil on mask. Welcome to our special interview segment, The Devil on Mask, The Truth Out. Hello, my name is Veronique Vatimfe. I am hosting The Devil on Mask from Kigali, capital of Rwanda. Our guest is Magnus Maximata. Thank you. Please introduce yourself to our listeners. Uh, like you said, my name is Magnus. I'm the editor for a Rwandan publication called Tarifa, and uh, I'm a journalist at the same time. We are doing this interview from Kigali, which has been completely rebuilt from the ashes of genocide. Can you explain what happened? It's, it's a hard question to answer um, on many fronts because uh, the genocide itself is such a complex thing, very difficult to explain to people who are not uh, victims or who are not uh, well conversant with what a genocide is. But our attempt, the genocide against the Tutsi was a catastrophe. It consumed the country almost entirely. Within 100 days, over a million people were killed, butchered. That is sad. Yeah. Everything, infrastructure, human capital, environment, everything was destroyed. I can imagine reconstruction was difficult. Uh, rebuilding a country that has uh, been hit hard, there's, there's no formula for that. Anyone coming to Rwanda marvels at how fast reconstruction has happened. Whatever has happened was uh, or has been uh, the effort of largely Rwandans and friends of Rwanda. We have now a country that uh, is stable uh, politically, economically and socially. The genocide of 1994 was not the first time that Rwanda had such mass killings, right? Uh, after the first, we, they usually call it a small genocide, when uh, after the 60s, there was really some serious killing of uh, the Tutsis, and houses were burnt, people were killed, and they had, some of them had to flee. And that's when the country began experiencing growth of really, really deeply entrenched hatred between Rwandans. Did foreigners, like the French, play a role in Rwanda genocide as we hear they did? It wasn't only segregation and uh, divisive politics that played a role, but also the support of uh, uh, foreigners, We're talking about France now. It supported a government that believed in divisive politics, genocidal tendencies. And that was the government of uh, the late President Habyarimana, he never allowed basic rights to the Tutsis. Many Ambazonians cannot wait to go back home. This turned out to be a trap for Tutsis under President Habyarimana. They were not even allowed to come back home after the first genocide I talked about earlier. Uh, he used terms like the country is like a glass of water that is full you cannot add more water. So what happened was that um, 
the life out there of these refugees was miserable and they kept pushing for return back home. When they planned to use forceful means to come as a retaliation, the government began planning to kill every single tooth in the country. It was, it is documented, it is everywhere. And this was taking place in the, in the presence of the international community. In Ambazonia right now, neighboring countries are playing no role to help end the mass executions. What was the case during the Rwanda genocide? No neighboring country, no friends of Rwandans played a role to stop the genocide. It was stopped by Rwandans themselves. Do you see any similarities with what is happening in Cameroon at this time? Yeah, not just Cameroon. It happened in Sudan. And now we're seeing the same thing in, in Cameroon. It's miserable. What policies, in your opinion, facilitated the genocide? Segregation, uh, discrimination. How did segregation work against Tutsis in Rwanda? If you were Tutsi, there are certain schools you didn't go to. Or there, were, there was a limit to a level of education. You couldn't go to university unless you go out of the country. But now the worst part was that you couldn't even be given a passport. Travel documents were limited. Those are some of the policies that lead to you know, genocide. Because people have, at some point, they get fed up and they fight back. Power sharing, and political discourse that is not sensitive to sharing power is very dangerous because some people feel excluded. What do you think should happen to policies in Amazonia where people are denied dignity and are considered second-class citizens? These policies should be banned everywhere. A country is meant for all states people. Everyone. There is not supposed to be a policy that discriminates a particular group of people or a certain setting or a certain region. What were the failures of the United Nations and the African Union in Rwanda? You see, we all know what is called hypocrisy. Like you have everyone sitting in meetings and conferences and summits, talk about uh, security, talk about peace. But when it comes to real, the real world, nothing gets done. Do you think officials at the UN and the African Union care? Bureaucrats in those organizations who do not care. The UN, unless you don't know the, the history of the UN, but the UN at some point, not only the rigidity of the institution, but the mandate is compromised and we've seen it as Rwandans, we've seen it, we've experienced it. It has limitations because by the by the way the way it was created, Africans were not part of of, of the deal and does not have so much sensitivity in what happens on the continent. You have a case of Rwanda where uh, troops were withdrawn and uh, ammunition was taken away. People were killed. Barely no, no bullet shot by the UN troops to stop the genocide. We have another case uh, in Congo. You have a troop that, you know, contingent that spends almost a billion dollars a year. And Congo is now not just a, a conflict zone, but a place where you can't describe the word peace for the people there. So these institutions barely help. You are aware of what is going on in Cameroon. Do you think it, it's normal? Well, the situation in Cameroon, like it was in Rwanda, is absurd. Uh, but I'll mention just three critical elements here. Such kind of situations require really bloody engagement. If politically things have failed, there are no talks within the country, 
and stakeholders, talking about people who are party to what is happening, if they are not agreeing on peaceful resolutions, uh, it, it will force people to defend themselves against that kind of, uh, of behavior. Would you blame Ambazonians for turning to weapons to defend themselves? You can't victimize people for such a long period of time and expect them not to defend themselves. What happens, communities faced with that kind of situation, they forge ways of defending themselves. They can seek help from outside, they can seek help from friends or take matters within their hands and hold guns and defend themselves. So that's why I was saying it's, at some point it will be bloody. But now the problem is you have uh, uh, corrupt leaders, uh, immoral leaders, who have no sense of humane or statesmanhood to be able to understand that what is happening has to stop because it is a country that belongs, in this case, to Cameroonians, not foreigners. The role and the entrenchment of the French into Cameroonian politics and uh, affairs of the state is so disgusting. The genocide in Rwanda happened despite the never again pledge. Would you advise Ambazonians to trust the world or anybody other than themselves? No, don't trust anybody. That's a very big mistake. Very big mistake. If Cameroonians cannot be trusted to be part of peaceful resolution, and solve a problem between them and, and uh, Amazonians. Why would Amazonians trust a foreigner? I, I don't know what to say about this, but I think Cameroonians will have to do the extraordinary. Amazonians. The Amazonians will have to do the extraordinary. If they are not getting help from friends, they will have to go into a really bloody war and defend themselves. In your opinion, what is the most important first thing that Ambazonians must do? The first thing Ambazonians will have to do is to sacrifice. People should not even think twice. It's a sacrifice if they want to save and secure their country and a livelihood. They will have to step in and sacrifice themselves. But do not expect someone else to come and sacrifice their, 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 themselves for you. That is the last resort. The first step is to get in and mobilize yourselves and see how you can do it. If it is not working, to have a conversation with the Cameroonian president to solve this problem, you will have to mobilize the resources, engage the masses, and let everyone get in, into it. I, I, it is absurd, but uh, at some point it will have to happen. What can you say to the people of Amazonia who are facing mass executions at the hands of French Cameroon, facilitated by the same France which played a role in the Rwanda genocide? Again, like I was saying, don't expect the French to come and give you a foot massage. They are amassing wealth and living at the expense of Amazonian's life, they don't care. So the leaders of, of Amazonia, opinion leaders, think tanks, politicians, the army will have to mobilize wisely and secure their country. There's nothing else. You can't sit back and let your heads be headed. You have to fight back. This is very sobering. Thank you, Magnus, for talking to Ambazonia Calling. Thank you. We thank you for the articles you've been publishing in Rwanda on the genocide in Ambazonia. We hope we can welcome you to Ambazonia one day soon to celebrate the restoration of our independence. So get on now on the train. Everybody get on now on the train. Mothers, fathers get on now on the train. Children, get on now on the train. Sister, brothers, get on now on the train. Husbands, wives, too, get on now on the train. Oh,
Father bless us. Oh, Jesus Christ, oh, guide us. Oh, Holy Spirit, lead us on the restoration journey of our liberty. So, restoration train is our freedom train. The donor community in Cameroon, led by the United Nations Resident Mission in Yaoundé, has gone out of its way to create groups of women and to cause them to go out in demonstrations in streets lamenting and calling for peace, asking for peace from everyone except from the one person who is making war. The call for peace has now been echoed by Christian Cardinal Tumi. The question is, do we need peace, as Cardinal Tumi has argued, or do we need justice? I asked Manjong Judambe to weigh in on this one. To the extent that we are discussing this revolution and solutions to the Amazonian conundrum, there are so many things with which I disagree with His Eminence Christian Cardinal Tumi. Therefore, I'm delighted to announce that I agree with him on the way forward for Amazonia when he stated that, whatever will be the outcome of this revolution, it will spring from a dialogue table. End of quotes. I'm certain the Cardinal and I disagree on the kind of table and most importantly, what should be served on the dialogue menu. For instance, should Ambazonians dialogue now or go into arbitration, mediation or negotiations? Whatever form the talking takes, the most important single demand to make besides outright independence is for Ambazonians to demand justice. Peace, I would argue, is a distraction and a blinder. Those who say they seek peace cannot say who does not seek peace, except Paul Beer and his colonial regime in Yaoundé. Anyone can say they need peace, and all can claim they want to help us attain peace. It is my contention that we do not need peace if we cannot obtain justice, because peace without justice is impossible. Our people have been massacred because they seek justice, not because they seek peace. Our boys picked up arms in self-defense because of the injustice of having war declared against them. Peace without justice turned amount to status quo. And status quo is nothing but slavery. Only one person has disrupted the peace and all fingers must be pointing at him. There would be no amber boys if Mr. Bia wasn't slaughtering our people, charring our sick, old and ailing parents in their homes, burning down entire villages and hospitals, clinics and schools. Asking amber boys to disarm and or to drop their weapons is seeking neither peace nor justice. It is asking our people to put a rope around their necks and commit suicide. To preach the gospel of peace to Ambazonians today without asking the Bia colonial forces to demilitarize and leave Ambazonia is identical to asking a man locked in a den of lions to drop the only thing he relies on for survival. While I do not support armed struggle, you bet I fully support self-defense. Those simply calling for peace without insisting on justice for our people act like they are brain dead. They are in denial of the fact that Ambazonians are in an existential battle. As the United States Assistant Secretary for African Affairs, Mr. Timon Nagy eloquently reminded the world this week, this war is unwinnable. I must add that peace too is unwinnable, unless preceded by justice. It is Madiba, Nelson Mandela, who warned that, when aroused, the people are always capable of bringing down the towers of oppression while raising the banners of freedom. The longer colonial Yaoundé denies our people peace by pursuing the war they declared on us, the more unlikely it is that our people will ever surrender without obtaining justice. This is Manjong Jude Ambe for Ambazonia Calling. Restoration train is going to Bamenda. Restoration train is going on to Bohoya on the restoration journey of Alibati. Restoration train is moving very steadily. Restoration train is hooting very loudly. Restoration train to carry everybody on the restoration journey of Alibati. The 1964 Cara Declaration on African Borders reaffirmed in Article 4b of the Constitutive Act of the African Union, however, and signed off by the President of Cameroon, makes clear that demarcation of the territory of each African state is recognised as being such on the date of its independence. 
Does the United Kingdom government accept this to be the case or not? Has there been subsequent declarations that nullify these issues on borders? If not, it would follow that French Cameroon and Ambazonia are both able to assert territorial integrity. At no time before or, or after its independence from France was the southern Cameroon's part of that country known by its French name and style as La République du Cameroon. So, restoration train is Ambazonian train. Oh, oh. Mm. Restoration, restoration train. Whoa. Mm. Restoration, restoration train. Whoa. Mm. Restoration, restoration, restoration train is going to the borders. Most Ambazonians who hear about the role being played by Christian Cardinal Atumi are shocked, surprised. Horrified. Coach says he hopes it is a dream. I am still honorable to believe that His Eminence Christian Karna Tumi is flirting with the colonizers, the Republic of Cameroon. There are days I hope that this is just a bad dream. For four reasons, I always thought the Cardinal will be the last person to do such a thing. The first reason is the wonderful leadership the Cardinal provided during the 1990s, the consensus among the majority of Cameroonians was that Cardinal Tumi would be the ideal president to lead the country through the transition from a dictatorship to democracy. Cardinal Tumi turned it down, explaining that all he wanted to ever be was to be the priest of pastor that God has called him to be. He was so popular that Yaoundé lost sleep over the mere thought that he could get in a presidential race. The second reason is that the Cardinal described himself as the one person in Cameroon who had no fear speaking truth to power. He denounced the beer dictatorship without fear. He was the only person who contradicted the regime when he killed people with Commandement Operationnel in Douala. The third reason is that Kana Tumi never missed a chance to point out to the members of the regime, like Jacques Faman Dongo, that they could not speak the truth because they were afraid that if they did, they would be bundled and thrown into prison. The Canada would explain that he had no such fear because he was a free man. It was refreshing to hear him. The full reason is the story Karna Tumi told in his last book. In a recent TV interview, he explained to everyone that the French were bent on assimilating Ambazonians into Francophones. A French diplomat had told him about the plan, not realizing that he was not a Francophone. This is when the people of Ambazonia expected Karna Tumi to be their Moses leading them to the promised land. I hope that the Cardinal did not accept one of those bewitching golden statues that Mr. Beer shares out. Because if he did, then we need to pray for his deliverance from the Insing Gang. This is coach for Ambazonia calling. I want to tell the world about a little story. It is all about the golden statue. We started with the lawyers and then to the teachers. Came to the students and to the parents. Then came a nation called Ambazonia. Existence of this nation was based on the statue. You may wonder why it was based on the statue. Let me tell you now, it is a golden statue. Oh no, no, it is a golden statue. Oh no, no, it is a golden statue. Oh no, no. It's a golden statue, oh no, no, it is a golden statue. Now what is the worth of this golden statue? Oh, no. We can pay you back if it's just this statue. Don't let more children die because of this statue. Oh, Don't let them burn more villages because of this statue. We've got gold, we can give a bigger statue. 
Oh no no, who's gonna come to our rescue? In a city press, it is the golden statue. Let nobody fool you to say go. What more can I say? But Ambazonia has got talent. Let's turn our attention now to the role women play in the revolution, especially women in the guerrilla movements. And who else to do this paper for us but Barista Sia Jimbabwe? Let me begin with a pretty bold assertion. Women, even more than men in my opinion, will spare no sacrifice to love and nurture their families and to be at the center of the creation of communities and nations that stand firmly on the pillars of freedom, justice and equality. Like men, women want to restore their dignity and dictatorship and exploitation of the poor by the strong and powerful. For these and other reasons, women have always been an important part of guerrilla warfare. Warfare and armed conflict have always had women in both the rank and file, in the command chain, in top leadership, and in the strategic planning reserve for war rooms. From the beginning of time, women have led or participated in militarized action, conventional or otherwise. Here are just a few whose names and history you may be familiar with from within the African continent or of African descent. In 131 BC, Cleopatra II of Egypt led a rebellion against Ptolemy VIII Physcon and drove him and Cleopatra III out of Egypt. In 1630, Zinga of Ndongo and Matamba from the Kingdom of Matamba led a series of revolts against the Portuguese. She aligned with the Dutch Republic, forming the first African-European alliance against another European aggressor. In 1720-1739, Granny Nanny, a spiritual leader of the Maroons of Jamaica, led rebel slaves in the first Maroon War against the British. In 1900, Ghanaian Ya Asantewa led the Ashanti in rebellion against the British. In 1986-1987, Alice Ayuma led a rebellion against Ugandan government forces. The brave people of Com in Ambazonia owe their travel to and settling in Com to the great warrior and lady founder of the Com Kingdom who led them on a python trail to Laikom. One of the untold stories and unsung songs of military heroism is that of women in the ranks of the Ambazonia guerrilla forces. Have you ever heard the names Fielas or Queen Tigress, for instance? Well, these are just two of the many Amazonian women who have baffled even the best of male warriors with their courage, bravery, and talent as fighters for motherland Amazonia. These women fighters in Amazonia face exactly the same difficulties as the aforementioned women in ancient and more recent history. Women fighters tend to be more deadly when they join the ranks to avenge the death of loved ones, such as a father, a husband, brother or son. They are even deadlier when their determination to end genocidal atrocities combined with their sworn word to avenge for sexual abuse or the use of rape as an instrument of war. The role of women in the face of heinous crimes being committed in Amazonia is not to allow themselves to be used as a legion of lamentation or as tools in the hands of the colonizer and its agents. It is not to shed crocodile tears calling for peace without insisting that justice must be done for peace to reign. True Amazonian women will not rest while this revolution is on until they rest in peace. Obviously, and I must insist on this, the time is here for all Amazonians, especially Amazonian men, to recognize the contributions of female warriors like Fielas, Queen Tigress, and many others. It is time to hail their bravery and honor their sacrifice. Our triumphant march into Boya will be successful if the men work more with and show no reserve in advocating a restored Amazonia in which one's gender is not an obstacle to one's plans of realizing what I'm already calling the Amazonian dream. This is C. Ajimbo Ambe for Amazonia Calling. We 
don't do foolish. But when there are capital fools out there, we make it our duty to find them. And every week we crown one of them the Nyamfuka of the week. We've got a rundown of the kings and queens of foolish for this week, and here to deliver them is Veronique Vetumfe. Coming in in third position this week are the many online haters who would not want the success of the All Southern Cameroonian People's Conference convened for next weekend in Washington, D.C. They seem to be jealous that some other conference, not the one they organize, might actually succeed and bring together Ambazonians. Why don't they just stay away from the conference? Come on now. Must you poison the world just because you do not intend to draw water from it? The jealous and hate-filled people trying to sabotage the DC conference, beginning with those of them who recently invited Ambazonians to their own conferences in Boston and Philadelphia are this week's third place finishers for the crown of shame, the Nyamfuka of the week. Nyamfuka them all. Finishing in the position of runners up this week is a young man who has done well for himself in this revolution. When he needed to, Ray Baba, did not hesitate to plagiarize the I Have a Dream speech of Martin Luther King Jr. to begin his charm operation to the heart of the IG group. His heart was worn over. He found love and crawled into the bed of the IG group, even becoming an ambassador to the United Nations. Like a political Ashawo, Ray Baba has now jumped out of bed screaming that he never enjoyed the marriage nor the sex. For failing to take responsibility for his own share in setting up the monster that the IG group has been for this revolution. Ray Baba is this week's runners-up for the crown of shame, the Nyamfuka of the week. Nyamfuka them all. The winners of this week's crown of shame are none other than the surrogates of the Ambazonia Governing Council. Once, not so long ago, they ridiculed the less than 30 people who gathered in Lagos, the mafia which met in Zaria, and proclaimed a government. Apparently, AGC surrogates were mad and would not recognize the IG group just because it was not the AGC that was in charge. All over social media this week, these surrogates sang hymns in praise of the AGC. Just like that, an executive office of the president. His Excellency, the CIC was created in a manner no different from the IG group, proclaiming itself the new game in town. In the hope of paving the way to acceptance, the AGC told the world that Spain, which has not yet recognized Catalonia, is on the verge of recognizing Ambazonia. For being such hypocrites and spinning falsehoods, surrogates of the AGC are this week's winners of the crown of shame, the Nyamfuka of the week. Them all. This is Veronique Vertinfe for Ambazonia Calling. Africa's baby nation, Ambazonia, has gotten off to a great start, and sometimes Ambazonians are far too hard on themselves. They don't recognize how much ground they have covered. Here is Delano Mukong with a commentary written by Shidon Luke. The emerging Ambazonia nation is going through its share of childhood challenges. A runny nose here, stomach upsets there, feelings of nausea and vomiting that hit the young Ambazonia. 
will, as with every child, enhance the immune system to better cope with future challenges. Setbacks will not kill. They prime the body to resist. If anything, Amazonians do not give themselves enough credit for their incredible achievements so far at galvanizing people towards the noble goal of restoring independence. Far too much time is wasted lamenting over the bad apples, the liars, the embezzlers, the schemers, the scammers, the manipulators, the finger choppers, and those itching to pull others down and trample upon them if that helps them rise in power. Ambazonians should take a victory lap. We are closer in 2019 to independence than we ever were at any time in our history. It came through individual and collective genius of our people, helping themselves while asking for the heavens to help them. Our people, inspired by love of Mother Amazonia, fashioned out a flag. They composed a national anthem that even newly born Amazonian children, hardly off breastfeeding, are already struggling to sing. Good job, good job, good job. Sing it again, let me hear. Have a show, yes, that is freedom. It's here, it's it our need. This is the never again generation. Ambazonia's march to freedom will have its dark days and moments. As on every journey, we may have a flat tire. The engine of our restoration train can overheat. Slightly delaying our journey to Boya, but there is no stopping our march. This is Delano Muko from Amazonia Calling. This thing will go on for 50 and 100 years. You cannot kill everybody. And even if you kill everybody, the stones would avenge for the blood that spills on them. The soil will get up and start fighting. The people of West Cameroon cannot be your slaves. The people of West Cameroon are not. You did not conquer them in war. The problem we have in West Cameroon is the problem that will bring down Cameroon. When people have had pent-up anger and pain, humiliation, for over 50 years, when it bursts out, you will never be able to control it. They will sooner realize that the people of Ambazonia will not surrender. They will sooner realize that you can arrest and kill, but the more you arrest and kill, the more you energize the people's spirit. Our guest on the Devil on Mars, Pedro's Haile, our Eritrean brother, had a number of very pertinent messages that he delivered directly to Ambazonians. Messages that by popular demand we are revisiting today. Who better to do that than the monk from Ibali Kumato, Vezikov himself, the man who delivered that interview to us? Haile, who knows a lot about Eritrea's successful quest for independence, roundly endorses and justifies Ambazonia's case for restoration. For Ambazonia, you have a solid case, you know, a solid case. The criminal silence from the international community is just what the world does. On Eritrean case, they, they were just silent. They did not say anything about that. They're not going to talk about uh, 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 the Ambazonia. Another nasty habit of the world, which he says Ambazonians need not be apprehensive about, is the fact that... They will call you all kinds of names. If, if the U.S. is an ally of Ethiopia, mm -hmm. the Eritreans are automatically a secessionist. Or, uh, if it, to give them a worse name, you would call them a terrorist. You know? So th those labels are there, but that does not describe you. The world stops calling you terrorists and all manner of unholy names once they realize that you are winning on the ground. The U.S. policy by itself, they see the reality on the ground. When the Eritreans were uh, you know, occupying more lands and uh, were near to... Uh, defeating the enemy, then the, the alliance switch. You're no more terrorist. You're no more secessionist. You're a liberation movement fighter. That switch always happens. As bad as it is, 
the infighting among Amazonians compares with what he describes as a civil war that unfolded among Eritrean liberation movements. There's a civil war in Eritrea among the liberation movements. Oh. Uh, most of the time they were fighting each other. So it weakens the movement. It weakens the nationalist movement. Infighting has consequences, he warns. By some account, some Eritreans will say Eritrean independence would have, had, would have been realized in 1975. But imagine, from 75, it took another 15 years to actually declare it. Two similarities between the Eritrean war and Ambazonia's quest are scary. One faction unilaterally transformed itself into the government and started persecuting the others, forcing others into exile and ultimately laying the foundation for present-day dictatorship in Eritrea. I believe in 1980, uh, the Eritrean Liberation, the People's Liberation Movement, mm. uh, Front, mm. uh, decided that uh, the country cannot uh, hold more than one group. So they, they got rid of the other one, they chased them away, all of them, practically all of them, went to Sudan. From that day on, it was uh, dominated by one political party. That is probably one of the reasons you know, uh, since there's no check and balance yeah. or two per perspective, after independence, uh, the legacy was uh, dictatorship. dictatorship. As a result of the seed of dictatorship sown during the liberation struggle, tyranny became the harvest. And I also wanted to talk about what happened after independence. Yes. That, that Cameroonian must really pay attention, yes. especially the Amazonia. Yes. When you conduct a liberation movement, uh, it has to have a democratic nature into it. I would say, yeah, those transparencies, those democratic procedures, a rule of law has to be in place in, in Amazonia. Excuse me? When you conduct a liberation movement, uh, it has to have a democratic nature into it. Excuse me? When you conduct a liberation movement, uh, it has to have a democratic nature into it. Without putting in place democratic dispensations, you end up with dictatorship and the country could continue to generate refugees. So uh, Eritrea after 30 years of war, but after independence, what we see is another dictatorship. Yeah. In fact, it often is compared to the North Korea type of dictatorship. Eritrea is the highest refugee producer per capita. About 5,000 refugees uh, leave their country on a, monthly, on, on a monthly basis. On how Ambazonia should make peace with the Republic of Cameroon when the time comes, he warns that we should not please the outside world. When Ambazonia became independent, you may deal with the Republic of the, the French-speaking Mm -hmm. you, you may make peace, but when you do that peace, it should not be symbolic, it should not be for the consumption of the outside world. Highly does not expect the killing to stop. If the, the resistance is peaceful, but the other side is not willing to come halfway, uh, the killing will not stop. Given the monstrous nature of the Paul Bia regime, and wants Ambazonians to know they will have to win victory without expecting any concessions from Bia. Paul Bia has been in power for 36 almost years. 36 years as a president. Prior to that, he was a prime minister. You know more than Prior I. to that, he was a secretary. So since 1968, the man was there in power, one way or the other, and 36 years as a president. And uh, you don't expect much concession from By popular demand, this has been the monk from Ibali Kumato, revisiting the interview we had with Haile for Ambazonia Calling. This is Ambazonia. One nation, one soul, one people. Sacrificing, bleeding, and yes, dying if need be until we kick the colonialists out 
and enthrone a government of the people in Boya. This is Amazonia Calling. Because you have your army of occupation out in West Cameroon, you believe that when the people will rise, even if you took the whole of the French army and added to yours, you will never bring them down. And I call on all Cameroon soldiers to lay down their arms within Ambazonia and to turn their arms against the very system that has made them slaves in the land of their birth. For more stories from around the world, go to the World Wide Web at themissionstribune.com, compassfreepress.com, and africafreedomnetwork.com. Here is our letter to Joshua. Dear Joshua, there is just so much bad news, I don't know where to start, even as a messenger of bad news. Because look at it, let me give you a rundown. 72, Joshua, take note of that number. 72 human rights organizations have appealed to the United Nations Human Rights Council, your country sits on NATO, the organizations ask the council to disregard your sovereignty, to just fly in, responsibility to protect. It's about stopping the commission of mass murder. We've given them permission already to come into Amazonia. The United Kingdom and 37 other countries, they want you to get the hell out of Amazonia. And they want you to do it fast. They're being very polite. They're not saying it the same way I say it, but you better take it from me. That's what they mean. And the French, the French have stopped talking to you directly. Manu Macron, he no longer talks to you, no longer takes your call because you don't take anybody's advice. The only thing they're looking for now is the road to the bunker. They want to pull you out, Joshua. Let me give you some more bad news because you may think that's all. The Americans told you about it, Joshua. You need to go. You need to go. They even showed you a picture of who you should follow. I mean, like all the way to the grave. You know how nice Americans have been with you. So they can tell you everything is going well with trade and investment and security. But they have turned off the financial tap. There's no more money going to be. There's no more money going to funding training. There's no more military equipment coming in. The IMF and the World Bank have turned off the financial taps. The projects are going to start closing. New projects are not coming in Joshua. No new money. That's what it means. And closely behind the IMF and the World Bank, the African Development Bank is going to close shop. They're going to stop funding Joshua. There's going to be little to nowhere to turn around and find anything. What with all the thieves? that are packed up at Nkondengi. Everyone has emptied the treasury wherever they were. When Alibaba and the 40 thieves start raiding the public treasury, what do you think is going to happen? At the CDC, oh, there's not a franc left. The CDC is like the treasury of the church right. There's nothing inside. Did I tell you that Sonara was also dry? There's no money left there. Oh, you're the one who emptied it. I was forgetting. And the SNH. Money gone. And the treasury. Money gone. And I can see why you cannot even book. You cannot even book two weeks at the Intercontinental in Geneva. You're broke, man. They used to say chop broke pot and you were resisting. Here you go. Here you go. You win the title now. And as a result of all this bad, bad news, there will be no salaries in March for civil servants. Beginning with your very soldiers, your bodyguards. Be careful, Joshua. Someone's going to put a nice little bullet on your head because they didn't get paid. I know those guys. They don't like to go a day without their salary. But maybe you're able to cope. Maybe you can borrow from Chantal. Or maybe you could borrow from Samuel Eto. He's got a jet that brings you people when he wants you to win elections. You could just get some money from Eto. Why did Thibaut Nagy have to do the thing he did to you? I mean, not only did he bring you that picture about, you know, 
the fact that you should follow the other man to wherever he is now, which is like in the grave. So Thibaut comes to you and you are so cocksure you're going to be winning this military victory in Ambazonia. And then he just takes the air out of your balloon by telling you that Ambazonia is going to be like your Vietnam. Like Americans in Vietnam, you can put the best men on the best gear, nothing will give. That's very cruel. I mean, Thibaut could say it differently. He could like say it would take you a long time, something like that. So Joshua, I'm here in my official capacity as the messenger of bad news. All the dark clouds on earth are hovering over Angola. By the end of this week, it will become impossible for you to pull off anything with Christian Cardinal Tumi. Even that small tiffy tiffy advantage that you thought you had is gone. There is a shortage of everything. There's a famine about to break in the three northern regions. And in Ambazonia, of course, but that does not concern you. You saw how our people, they just burn up all that stuff you sent to them. You think we take poisoned bread and sardine on our side of the world? No, we don't feed on that stuff. Now, this is one of the most interesting ones. You know, the, all the people who plotted the 6th of April 1984, they were all hiding. This time around, the Ambazonians are promising support to anyone who is willing to topple you. It looks like we finally got to the 99 days for the thief, one day for the master part, where this one day really is the day when, uh huh, you get thrown out of power. You have been listening to Ambazonia Calling. We came to you from our studios here in Washington, D.C. Our producers today, Jeff McCoy. Logistics, Joe Costa, and Krisa Cunningham. Our music is from Ken Wanaku, the monk, from Bali Kumato Vazukov himself, from William Fo, a number of music star of blessed memory, from Eric Matisse on the web at soundimage.org, and from Prince Ajua Alem of Ajam Soniketron, USA. Ambazonia Calling is a joint production of Africa Freedom Network, The Missions Tribune, and Compass Free Press. You can find us on the web at missionstribune.com, at compassfreepress.com, and at africafreedomnetwork.com. Next Sunday is another date. Until then, keep the spirit, keep the faith, keep up the good fight for justice and independence for Ambazonia. Stay Amber Strong.